Good morning. It is so great to be together this morning. My goodness, this has been quite a week. Yes. This has been quite a week, hasn't it? For this congregation, uh, this has been a, a journey all of itself in the last week. I mean, just, just briefly recount because I'm not going to go over it again. But, you know, a week ago last night, there were a whole bunch of very dedicated, um, brave firefighters, law enforcement officers, utility company personnel that gathered here to help put out the fire, a, a huge fire, and to protect the rest of this community. They are servants of the Lord. And we are grateful for those who are there. And then early the next morning, very skilled ATF personnel, investigators were here going through the ashes. Very skilled people who were dedicated to finding causes and, uh, and then to, from that point, actually, they don't know that necessarily, but to help this congregation then move forward because that investigation is important. But we don't linger on that. And then the, at 10 o'clock last Sunday morning, leadership from this congregation, a lot of the leadership gathered together in the pastor's home, and they came together to care for each other, just to really tend to each other's concerns and needs as they were there. They talked uh, about how best to care for the rest of the congregation because they have that responsibility. And then they also then took time to plan next steps. They were faithful in that. I had the privilege of attending that meeting and was so very impressed as to a person, uh, they, were committed to the, they were committed to the future of the church here in this community. And the word that went out from them that morning was, God placed us here, we're not going anywhere. This is where God has placed us, this is where he has called us, and this is where we will serve him. Now the great thing about Pastor Mike and this congregation is that even though this is the headquarters kind of where they, where they serve, this is the sending point. And so understand that they are committed that this will remain the sending point. And that God, they believe that God will bless, uh, and as has already been stated a number of times, you know, there is one that sought to destroy. Oh, but, and so he sought, and the enemy thought, and the enemy that we have is not flesh and blood. And scripture says it's powers and principalities of darkness. And he sought to reduce the church to ashes. But God. He has other plans. Because you see, no fire can reduce God. No fire can take him from his throne. No fire. No fire can reduce the one who spoke all things into creation. Uh, he spoke into creation that which eventually from seed to seed to seed produced a tree that was this wood. And when this wood is long gone and it looks like it's seen better days, God will still remain. For he is faithful. Now, one of the things that was said even while the fire was going on that Saturday night is that... Uh, the building burnt, but the church is alive and well. Now, my friends, I, we don't have to understand everything. In fact, the idea of faith and trust has been a part of the Christian faith since the church's very beginning and before. 
And God has always come close to those who, who wanted to come close to him. And I have witnessed this week a leadership of this congregation saying, we also, we're going to do this, but we've also got to do it right. And so I report to you that last Sunday morning, leadership of this congregation spent time just seeking the clean hearts before God and before each other to make sure that nothing, I repeat, nothing remained as clutter in the hearts, the foundation of our lives so that they could lead this congregation and this community into an uncluttered and truly God-provided future. That's the job. Now, I don't know what's going to happen at that, um, the old sanctuary area over there. Uh, you've seen what I've seen, and there's a lot of char and rubble and all kinds of things. Somewhere down under there is a foundation. And what uh, the leadership said last week is, if we're going to lead, our foundation must be clear and clean and ready to be able to be showed and shared with the world around us. I commend that leadership, for they've said, you know, we believe and know that God by His Spirit will lead and He will provide, but we must do our part. And so the first part was just to come before God and say, Jesus, you are the subject. You're the subject of the church, you are that one that even though we're going to be involved in so many different things, it will all revolve around Jesus, who is the Lord God Almighty who came and gave himself for us. Now today, uh, we are here because he is faithful. And I would suggest to you today that we can go forward as people without fear, because, you see, the scripture tells us that he goes before us and he will provide the way. We're here today also because of a lot of people who did a lot of work this week. You see, he, God is the senior partner. But we have our part and our place as he puts us in order. And so today, I, as an executive director of the Church of God in Southern California and Southern Nevada, I want to invite you. They might have been here last week. I want to invite you to join together as the, as the family of God, as the body of Christ, as the homeland community, as perhaps the community of faith of the valley, to say to one another, we walk together because... He has placed us together. And that's by his design. It isn't something that human people can put together or speak into existence, for we do very little creating. But God is the one who says, yes, I will be with you, and I will see you all the way home. This morning, I uh, like to read uh, for you and maybe with you Scripture from the book of Joshua, chapter 1. <clears throat> and when you get to chapter 1, verse 1. I just wanted to help you there so you don't have to search too far. This is Joshua. He is in, he's just being in, been installed as the leader of the people of Israel here. And this is what it reads. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give to them. To the Israelites, I will give you every place where you set your foot. As I promised Moses, your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon, and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. 
no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Well, taking a look at that, God is speaking to Joshua. The Israelites have escaped from the Egyptians where they've been in, in bondage and slavery for a long time. God's delivered them and from that slavery. They've wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, largely just because of their own problems, not because that's just where God wanted them to be, but he's, they needed to take care of issues within them. Your leadership said, we're not going to wander for 40 years. We're going to come before God now. We're going to take care of those issues now. We're going to do those things right so that we can be in a place where God can lead us. That's a healthy place. My dear friends, I would suggest to you that the church of God in Homeland is healthier this Sunday than two Sundays ago. God is still faithful. He's provided, he's shown how he provides, but get this. He's also revealed to Homeland Church and, and some persons beyond our local church who you are. That you are loved ones of God. And he loves you and he provides for you and he has planned for you. And that plan does not end just because of the burning of a building. Here the Israelites were and, and, and all of the original bunch has died off except for Joshua and Caleb. Even Moses, their leader, is gone. Moses had been the leader of the Israelites for, over, for, for 40 years, and he had a lot of opposition over those years. But he was the leader, and he was the one God spoke to. He was the one who received the directions from the Lord, and he's the one who had helped all the others uh, settle their differences and try to also help them see the direction of God. Moses was the man, so to speak, in his day. But now Moses was dead. Who was going to have to fill the shoes of Moses? The Lord speaks then to Joshua these words. He tells Joshua, the time has come for you to lead these people. Guess who gets to fill Moses' big shoes? Josh. Uh, excuse me, Joshua. The Lord tells Joshua that he will be with him just like he was with Moses. He tells Joshua he'll give him whatever land his foot touches. And he tells Joshua no one will be able to stand against him for that long haul. He would know opposition, but there is a difference between knowing opposition and having someone stand against you. There will be times in the days to come when this congregation and the people of faith in this community are going to know some opposition. I mean, it's, it's a big deal to rebuild. It's a big deal. And there's so much that's required and involved and sometime you're going to get tired and you're going to think, is it worth it? And the Lord, but there's where you, you are together and you turn to the Lord together and say, you have called us to this task. We're going to believe that you will see us all the way through it. How do you think Joshua felt about this? Uh, do you think he had doubts about filling the shoes of Moses? Do you think he might have thought to himself, there's no way I can do this? Do you think maybe Joshua was a little bit scared about his ability to do it? Your pastor today is strong because he knows that of and in himself, he cannot do this task. True. He understands that unless God does it, it's not going to get done. He understands that his strength is actually proven to be, 
to be strength as he trusts, as he places that trust and depends on the Lord. And I would suggest that that would be a good place for you and me to be. The pastor isn't in this alone. We're in it with him. I invite the community to be in it with them. Uh, the church, this congregation, is not in this community to be separate from you. This congregation, they believe, has been placed here to be a part of you, and you a part of it, so that God can do some, gr some great and wonderful things, so that every person in homeland can understand that they are not overlooked by God, that God loves them, he does, and, and that they have, you have, his full attention. Now, he might not have our full attention, but understand that you have his. When the fire took, out, took off and raged a few hundred feet away from us last week, folks, God didn't turn his back on us. Just as he told Joshua, I will never leave you nor forsake you, that is still the promise that God has for us. He didn't leave. He didn't go anywhere else. He remained with us. And, and testimony after testimony after testimony of people who have walked together this week have said, I have, I have known the presence of God all week long. Look at this. This is powerful and remarkable to be in this tent a lot of good folks have worshipped in tents through the ages. And we get to be those people. And God promised that he would be there in the midst of them. And folks, that's his promise for you and me today. I, I want to, I'm going to bring this, wrap this up, but what, would you, let me read the next three verses, four verses. Verses six through nine. Be strong and courageous. Because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and be very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. I tell you today, that just as that was the promise and the word of God to, to Joshua back so many years ago, I mean, actually, before even the time of Pastor Mike. I just threw that in, that was extra. I would suggest to you today that that promise is still true to us today. What God is really saying to them then, draw close to me. Heed my word. Back then they only had the old written law. But he's still saying the message is still the right thing for us today. Know my word. Immerse yourself in my word. Hear it and obey it. Draw close to me. Make sure you don't put off this word or that word for your own choosing. But accept my whole counsel. Draw near and be obedient, and I will provide for you just as I and only I can. That's the word of the Lord. Now, who are you leading? You're leading the church. You're also leading people into a relationship of promise throughout this community, throughout this valley, and beyond. You have great opportunity, but you must be strong. The greatest strength comes when you are in this and you recognize that you're in this together. 
The strength of the people of Israel isn't when they split off and said, oh, I'm going to go this way and you go that way and you go this way and I'll go that way. It was when they came together and together they honored and worshiped God. When they came together and they prayed together and they sought his presence and when they found his presence to be true, then they also recognized and worshiped him. My dear friends, that's the call of God for you today. For the one that you worship will be the one you follow. If you do not worship him, you will not follow him. And he's worthy. Be strong. Be strong together. Encourage one another. Remind each other of the faithfulness of God. Remind and share with each other the story of his faithfulness that you have seen even this week and in the days and weeks to come. And then, be courageous. Take steps of faith. Take steps together. We need in this community some courageous families who will train up and raise up children to honor God, to love Him and serve Him. We need courageous community that will stand against wrong and stand up for right, and will join hands together in doing that. And then lastly, we need a courageous church. A church that will honor God when no one else does, and will serve him when he's not so evident. In the, in the midst of ashes, we will look for his glory. In the midst of ashes, we will look for evidence of his presence. And in the midst of ashes, we will lift each other. God's word is forever. Would you join with me in prayer? And Pastor Mike is going to come and lead us. I just, I, and Pastor Mike, will you come? I just want to pray for you. My friend, I thank you right now for your goodness and your mercy to us. I thank you for my brother and my friend, whom you have called, whom you have set as a Joshua here. My Father, I pray that you would give him strength and give him courage. But I also pray that you will place around him people who will also choose this day whom they will serve and they will choose to walk in your strength and to be courageous in your spirit. Thank you for what you have set in order. May we be a people who seek you in all things, in every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's my privilege to give you an encouraging close. Today, the world is watching us. A week ago, did you ever imagine that would be the case? Not just Homeland, but thanks to the network news, the Associated Press, United Press International, this country is watching and waiting and listening for our response. But it didn't stop there. I'd mentioned that all the synagogues in Tel Aviv, all the synagogues in Jerusalem, all the synagogues in Eastern Europe, and four synagogues in Ethiopia are praying for this church. They're watching and they're waiting. They want to know what we will do and what we will say. It's already been said, a building burned, but the church did not. The church is you and me, the temple of the Most High God. So what message are we going to send to this world? I have a strong recommendation. 
my recommendation is that we do not pay attention to the distractions. Pay attention to the one who made us and gave us life. Pay attention to this. Listen to this word. Colossians chapter 3. If you are risen with Christ, and that means you are risen with Christ. That's if and you are risen with Christ. Seek those things which are above. Would everybody say above? above. Don't look around you. Look above. That's where we concentrate, where Christ sits at the right hand of God. Set your affection. Would everybody say affection? Yes. Affection. Set your affection on things above, not things of the earth. For you are dead. Your life is dead. And you are alive, hidden in Christ, in God. That must be our focus. That we serve a risen Savior, and he's worthy to be served. And he gives us all kinds of hints and signs along the way. At 9-11, standing on top of the rubble was a perfect cross. Just look for the signs, they're there. Last Saturday, I walked on this property, and I looked and I saw an inferno. But I kept my eyes going up into the heavens, and I said these words, Lord Jesus, you will be glorified through all of this. I don't know how, but you do, and we will trust you. Amen. There are four crosses on or in that church. Every single cross was in place. This particular cross was on the stage, and I saw the inferno. I saw the fire. I saw firemen putting tons of water in the place where this cross was standing. And still standing, if you look at it, it can be easily milled down, and you'll see parts of it weren't even touched by flames. I'm still amazed, but I shouldn't be. Daniel 3.25 says this, Did we not throw three men in the fire? Well, who's the fourth guy? And the king says, Wait a minute, he looks like the Son of God. How would Nebuchadnezzar know the form of the Son of God unless God reveals himself? Amen. Listen, we're not in the fire alone. Somebody was walking in that fire. And he says, I've taken a symbol of death and turned it into a symbol of life, and I'll protect it as a message to my church. Man, do I love that. You know what else I love? That's a message to our world. That's a message to our community. How many people know that we have many hardship lives in our community? We have people who have suffered and have lacked and have lived very hard, broken lives in our community. What's it like for our community to look at us and say, wow, this is a broken church. At least the building's broken. From all outward evidence, there's brokenness here like there is in our community. What's our message? Our message is, you watch. You watch a God of restoration. Put a building together. Give us a temporary place of worship. And we might be here for a while. That's okay with me. I can worship God here, at home, down the street, around the corner, in your city, in your church. I can worship God, and so can you. But the message is, if a God of restoration cares about a building and will put it back in place, how much more does he care about the lives of every person broken in this community? And the joy is, we serve a God who can do that without any ifs. We're not even uncertain about it. 
We don't have to think about it. We don't have to pray about it. We know God is that good and he's powerful enough to restore any life and make it whole. Church, we're about the business of keeping our heads up, facing heaven, getting our minds and our affections on things above. Yeah, we got practical matters down here. Let the people tend to the practical matters. Who can deal with the practical matters? We as a church, we the church, we are the church, and we're looking up. Nobody has hung their head. I'm proud of you. Nobody has hung their head and said, poor me, woe is me. No. Thanks to God and his grace, we are looking forward and we are going forward. How about a song to celebrate that? All right. <laughs>